This tank chat is going to be about the German Panzer I tank. Here at the Tank Museum, we don't actually have an example of the turreted version of the Panzer I, the classic German tank of the interwar periods. But what we do have is this version here, which is the command variant. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So why the Panzer I? Germany is forbidden to build tanks because of the Versailles Peace Treaty uh, after the First World War and uh, it is limited to an army of 100,000 men and about 4,000 officers. Germany has lost militarily, it's lost the First World War and one of the things the German military have is they, in a way they've got that advantage of a blank sheet of paper. If they reconstruct they're going to have to start with the onus on whatever we did before failed. Um, whereas if you look at the other European armies in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, the French in particular, they look back to the First World War with a view that, look, our methodology must have been right because we won in the end. And if you look at that period in the 20s and 30s for the German military, what we really see is a defeated army looking at why it was defeated and coming up with new doctrine, equipment and tactics, including of course the tank, um, that they're going to use through to tremendously good effect for the German military in 1939 and 1940, those early victories. So what causes that amazing change in their fortunes? Now one of the figures we have to look at is uh, the, what becomes the, he becomes the commander of the German forces, the commander in chief uh, of the army, uh, Hans von Secht. And he is put in charge of the German military in 1920. He's actually at the Versailles Peace Treaty in 1919 as the German military representative. And as early as February of 1919, he is starting to send out discussion papers in the military about how they want to go forward in reforming what becomes the Reichswehr or the German army. Now that force um, that he's put in charge of, he absolutely moulds it along the lines of what he wants it to be uh, and gives it a direction and a sense of inquiry um, that is quite outstanding. So he, first of all, he get, makes sure that all the officers, they can at least look after a position about two grades above what they're serving in at the time. He makes sure they're all at graduate level and he starts, he's not allowed a general staff, but he starts a sort of forum of senior officers where they actually write papers, they challenge orthodoxy, and he builds on the Prussian military, German tradition, of being able to look back and study battles in the past to learn for the future. So they ruthlessly analyze what the German military did in World War I um, to learn lessons. There is none of this, um, what the Nazis later come up with, the stab in the back theory. Uh, the German military are absolutely uh, adamant they lost militarily and therefore what are they going to do about it. So discussion papers are formed and the other big thing that happens with the German military, they again build on this tradition of being able to test their theories with war games and exercise. They've been doing that for the last hundred years. So again, von Siegt puts that forward as if we've got an idea, let's test it and see if it's actually got validity. Will it work in the field? Can we do things with this? Now, one of the key things that von Siegt imbues this new German military with is his experiences in World War I, which were not on the Western Front, but on the Eastern Front fighting the Russians. And he's really keen on mobility and therefore he sees the potential of the tank um, and he is pushing the idea of mobile manoeuvre warfare using motorised forces. He, he sees that as a potential way forward um, for the German military and one of his early problems is trying to get the German army after the experience of World War I out of that trench mentality and the siege warfare sort of way of going about things. Now, um, as early as 1926, the German military are experimenting on their exercises about how they might use tanks. Of course, they haven't got any real tanks, hence we see the pictures of dummy tanks, cars made up to look like tanks. Um, and they start a discussion going and a body of work emerges very early in the 1920s about how the Germans might be using armoured vehicles such as a tank in the future. 
Now, in the background, we know as well that the Germans are looking after the Treaty of Rapello in 1922. They're looking to work with the Russians about experimenting. They start the Kleiner tractor and the Gross tractor, two code words, um, small and large tractor, to start building tanks um, secretly in Germany. They're shipped out to Kazan in Russia, 1928. They're driving around. They're starting to pick up on the lessons about how we might manufacture tanks, how they might be used in the future. And of course, when Hitler comes to power in 1933, he gives the German military the money, the opportunity to actually then almost expand and enact some of these ideas they've been having in terms of what they would like to build. They've been doing these experimentations in secret. This allows them then to go forward with a proper building program that then leads in the mid-1930s to the development and the building of the Panzer divisions. And again, um, we often associate Guderian with that. Um, Guderian, even though in his memoirs he's kind of claiming credit, trying to sort of say, I've always been struggling against higher authority that's not particularly bothered about tanks, etc. Actually, that's just wrong. Um, that's him just sort of bigging up his own role in the, in the affair. Yes, he's very important in the mid-1930s, but he's actually um, building on a lot of experimentation and good thought um, that has been going on in the German military for much earlier days. So they look at a programme of being able to build tanks. And uh, as we know, we've discussed already on our Panzer III tank chat, they look at building a tank that's going to be equivalent really of a cruiser tank and a support tank with a 75 mm gun on. So we're really talking there about Panzer III and Panzer IV. But almost instantaneously with that programme, they realise they need some tanks to get going on quicker so the German military can start seriously training and expanding its forces, hence the need for a Panzer I. Now already in 1932, uh, the Germans uh, under a coat cover have actually brought into the UK three Carden Lloyd carriers. Um, they look at those as thinking, here's the basis for a small light vehicle they could start building. Uh, and again, in the German system, under the Waffenamt, what they do is they go out this time to five different companies to say, here's a specification, we want about a five ton tank, two man crew, what can you come up with in a time scale that is ridiculously short? And they go to those five companies, they've got Krupp, they've got Daimler-Benz, they've got Rheinmetall, they've got Henschel, I always forget one, I'll come back to it. Um, but what ends up happening is Krupp is the winner. They are the one that takes the idea forward and it goes under a code word or code letters, LAS. Um, basically, basically, they're calling that again a light tractor they're building. Um, now that vehicle, uh, it comes out the first prototype in January of 1934. Uh, it goes into production in July of 1934. So this is a very, again, very quick time scale. And we often call them as an interim tank or as a training vehicle. Actually, the Germans, they build the first 150 without just the chassis, without any covers on the top, open vehicle, they are definitely training tanks. But the truth is the rest of the Panzer I production, uh, and it mounts up to about 1,800 vehicles, they are built with not just the idea of tra training the German military, but also with the idea that should combat come, these will be effective on the battlefield. Hence they are given armour plate that is proper armour plate, it's not just mild steel. So these are vehicles that are also being built with the idea that fighting might occur. And again, from the late 20s, or actually mid 20s, really Germany, one of its first enemies it was looking at that could potentially um, have a war with is Poland, of course. And so when we look back and we see these Panzer ones looking rather thinly armoured, they've only end up with two machine guns, they don't look that powerful a vehicle, but actually in the period that they're being designed and built, a lot of other countries have just machine gun armed tanks. And uh, really the Panzer I would, be, would fit in perfectly with that period. It is not sort of some sort of aberration, as if they're, they're not thinking forward enough. They're being sensible because they need to train the troops. They need something that should war come, they can use. But meanwhile, production of the Panzer III and Panzer IV, even though compared to, to modern days, it's a very quick production schedule, design and production, 
at the time the Germans are uh, jumping up and down, wanting tanks to get in the newly expanding army's hands. And of course, from the mid-30s, these new panzer divisions, how can we use those vehicles uh, or how can we train about using a panzer division if we don't actually have any kit um, to actually experiment or train with? So they're an important vehicle. Um, armament. Two MG13 7.92mm machine guns in a small turret designed by Krupp. It's only going to have a two-man crew, so commander in the turret, driver in the front, and the first model, the Alpha A, or the Mark I equivalent of the Panzer I, uh, that has an engine uh, that's designed by Krupp. It's an air-cooled engine, it's about 60 horsepower. Very quickly, um, they realise that this, after about 300 vehicles they build in the Alpha model, they realise that engine is not up to it. Now they're looking at building a command tank that they know is already going to need more power um, because of the nature of what it's going to be built like, so they then look at build, putting a, a new version of the Panzer I together, which is about just over a foot longer, and this time they also get a Maybach engine that can give it about 100 horsepower and the rest of the production of Panzer Ones um, is this ALF B uh, which is slightly longer and in making it longer as well with this new engine that they are housing they give it five road wheels as opposed to the four road wheels that are on the earlier ALF A. Now that Panzer C service in the Spanish Civil War um, all the countries that sent uh, Spain obviously was a, a testing ground for Russian and German vehicles. Um, the reports on the tanks are not particularly good, but that doesn't particularly worry the Germans because, again, from their point of view, a bit like the Soviets when their T tanks were being used in the Middle East, they didn't see the tanks being used in the way that they thought they would be used in a major conflict. Um, and it comes back to as well that idea, what were they really thinking these tanks are going to be used for? Again, back to von Siegt, he's got that idea of mobile warfare that he's been promoting and pushing. Um, and he's, again, when, even when he's left the military, his influence is still there. 1932, they do one of their exercises, the German manoeuvres. And again, they're looking at how could we integrate perhaps the cavalry and armoured cars together. And at the end of that exercise, even though it's been a, a, a sort of a, a pet project of Van Seat when it, before um, he'd left the military, actually at the end of that exercise, they realised straight away there is no way that horses can keep up with armoured cars on the open road, um, just like the British realised in 1918. So that exercise ends up saying goodbye to that as a programme, even though the French, the Americans carry on trialling this, you know, using horses and armoured cars together. Um, because again, the Germans are being very objective about this and it also tells the German cavalry they then realise their horses are so vulnerable on a modern battlefield they actually embrace motorisation and me mechanisation in a way that again is uh, quite salutary. They are not trying to hang on to their horses, they are going forward and again that influence going into the panzer divisions that they're looking there in the mid-1930s, how can we use what we hope is going to be the Panzer 3s and 4s coming into production, but these uh, Panzer 1 tanks and then Panzer 2 tanks into a mobile force that has support with it, engineers, uh, supplies that will go forward with it, to be able to not only break through but continue a battle into the enemy's rear areas and keep that sense, as von Secht has been saying all along the time, of mobility and manoeuvre back on the battlefield. Now, our particular vehicle we've got here is a result of some of that thinking, which is if you are going to have tanks like the Panzer I, you need to be able to control them on the battlefield. So again, very early on, the Germans are saying we need receivers or radios in those tanks. So they put the Fug II uh, receiver in all of the Panzer ones. The problem there is the commander cannot actually send radio signals. He's got to get out the tank and go to a different type of vehicle, quite often unarmoured or lighter, um, to actually send if he wants to go back and send messages to headquarters or command centres. So again, very early in the process, in 35, the Germans start looking 
had a Panzer one and thinking, how white might we adapt it into a command variant so the commander doesn't have to leave the battlefield and can continue sending messages not only out to the rest of his, whether it's a platoon or battalion or even a whole regiment of tanks, um, how can he also report back to higher headquarters? So they look at getting some of, they end up with about six of the Alsace tanks, they build up at Daimler Benz a structure on the top and uh, where the turret is, they almost the same sort of turret size, they put a little extra cupola on the top, top. And the idea being that inside that structure, a commander, a radio operator and a driver can fit and you not only have the FU-2, you also have the FU-6. Um, so he can actually send messages as well as receiving them. And there's space in there for map boards. Now the first six um, look fairly crude. Some of them when they're actually put together don't actually have, um, they were gonna put a machine gun ball mount on the front plate. Um, some of them the ball mounts weren't ready so they were plated over. But they like the idea of this and then they go on to actually producing about 180 of these what they call Kleiner or small Panzer Befehlwagen or command vehicles. Um, they make about 180 of them on the Alps B chassis. And again, um, different manufacturers make the, the basic chassis. It's Daimler Benz that puts it all together on the top there. Um, now, these vehicles, um, they're used in a Panzer division. You ended up with about 24 of them. So you've got right down from platoon uh, to battalion, uh, so the company and then battalion level, sometimes regimental level and certain other units were given these vehicles as well because if you're trying to keep up with the main armoured force um, and be in control, you need some sort of protection. Now they're used in the Spanish Civil War, a couple of them go out there, they're used mainly in Poland where again the German tank forces learn a lot of lessons, they also suffer a, a lot of losses and one of the problems they find is a very thin about 13 millimetre armour protection. So they add another 15 millimetres uh, of cut out armour plate onto the front before the invasion of France uh, in 1940. There's about 90 of these command vehicles are available to the German forces then. Um, they are already, as the word Kleiner, small command vehicle, already the Germans are looking that basically most models of tanks they're making, they're going to develop some sort of command variant in the production run. So their lifespan is relatively short in the Second World War. Some are later converted, just like the Panzer I tanks actually are to carry assault guns, um, some created into almost ambulance vehicles. All sorts of things are done because again, the Germans will quite happily reuse the chassis, um, but these, uh, their, their actual life in the front line uh, starts trailing off pretty quickly from 1941, although you will still see them being used sometimes by policing units um, and sometimes as training vehicles. But they are the first, um, the idea of putting that command variant, that's the first one that the Germans are doing and it leads again, just as a Panzer I is that first tank, that leads to so many things in the German military and how they're going to use armour in the Second World War. Our particular command tank here was actually sent out to Tripoli, North Africa, um, in March of 1941, and it ends up with the 5th Panzer uh, Division, 5th uh, Panzer Regiment first as well, but fighting there. It's captured by the British, and we can see on it, it's got that extra armour plate, uh, and on the side, you can actually see some battle damage where whether it's two pound rounds, we're not too sure, has actually penetrated that thinner 13 millimetre armour. So this, uh, as an example that we've got here, small vehicle, but it's representative of that amazing transformation that the Germans make in the 20s and the 30s, leading to those um, quite astounding victories that astonishes the West and certainly early on as well Soviet Union um, using panzer forces but with the ideas that have been developed starting just right after the First World War. As ever with these tank chats we're only doing them because you're supporting us 
So can I thank those of you who have joined our Patreon scheme or are supporting the Tank Museum in one way or another as an independent charity. Um, we just can't continue doing the activities we do unless we get public support. So please, if there's any way you can support us, Patreon's the obvious one to, we, we encourage people to go for, please do, and we hope you do still continue to enjoy these Tank Chats we're making.